social media today, we're seeing the best of people represented on Facebook, happy photos, you know, and that's great. We want people to be happy. But then we feel maybe that we measure slightly lower than that because people are only showing us their public selves. Are we writing only about these happy people and we're somehow terribly flawed, but they're better and they're more accomplished? I think everyone's lying on Facebook. Uh, and I think the lies are interesting, but they are fantasy, yes? They're almost like superhero versions of ourselves. There's, a, there's something called uh, Malibu Barbie, I think, which is just it's an app and, and Malibu Barbie gets put in all these different locations. Uh, she, one night she's at a beautiful restaurant, one night she's... And, and it's just to say the world of what we're putting up on Facebook is just a fantasy. It's just like a fairy tale. This is the life we would, we would like to live. But it's boring. It, when you look at other people's Facebook and they're in Bali or, or they're, they're, they're doing yoga and they're beautifully posed, we don't believe a word of that stuff, right? It's, it's all fake. If we were to post our real lives, I did an exercise in class where I had said, I will give you $20 if you take your camera and go take a picture of your bathroom right now without moving anything. Or take a picture of your bedroom without moving anything, the real bedroom, no one will do it. Because it looks awful, their real bedroom. But if you put that up on Facebook, people would love it because that's how you really live. So real stories are about not the fantasy Facebook, but the compelling stories would be if you took a picture of yourself when you just got up, if you took a picture of your bathroom the way it looks right now. That's fascinating. And the best storytellers give you those personal wounds. Uh, and that's why um, the, the whole superhero genre of movies right now is boring, it's crashing, it's burning, because people don't really identify with superheroes unless you're 11 years old. Uh, superhero, the only superhero movie that's really succeeded in the last year, and the best one is Guardians of the Galaxy. And the reason is you've got five deeply wounded people who are all sick, but they start supporting the, each other and they heal during the course of the movie. Now, one of the Avengers movies does that a little bit, but most of the other superhero movies fail. Captain America is a bore uh, because he's just a lot of muscles and he's a stoic. He never changes. So these superhero stories that are lining up from the studios, they're falling and they're crashing and they're burning one after the other unless they have a personal, embarrassing, wounded hero at the center who's really showing us his wound. That's the secret of a great superhero movie. But few studio movies do that because the way studios make their superhero movies now is they don't even hire writers. They think up action sequences and then they test them in Thousand Oaks uh, uh, movie theaters in the afternoon of a weekday. And if you like the action sequence, you say yes. If you don't, you say no on these little meters. And they assemble those sets of scenes as the entire movie. And that's just not going to give you a great film. And, but they're crashing and burning now. Personal stories are always what sell. Uh, so it, it, studios always feel like they've found a formula that doesn't require writers. They're always trying to take writers out of the equation and make it simply a product. But products sell because they're great. Stories sell because the product in it is flawed, right? That's the big difference. You can't sell a story like a product because products are supposed to be perfect and great. Well, in a story, it's about people's flaws and their embarrassments and their pain. And that's how you make a great story. And, okay, so, that, so, so it's about what Ceci was saying earlier about personal wounds. Every story that you like as an audience is about that. Every story is about that personal wound. It always, it always has been, it always will be. And that's all we do as story teachers, is we ask you, what's the wound of your hero? And how does that wound, how do they compensate for that wound at the beginning of the story? Because that compensation are your scenes. Here's an example. Um, 
I had a wound when I was a teenager. Um, my mommy didn't love me, and so because of that, I had body dysmorphia. I thought my lips were the size of Mick Jagger, and that was how my core wound manifested itself. So you can say, well, so what, Peter? That's for a therapist's couch. But the way it manifested itself in my life was I hid in the bathroom to eat lunch. I wouldn't kiss a girl during the day. I wore white chapstick all to hide my lips. I stopped playing the saxophone. Each one of those compensations for my core wound is a great scene in a movie. You can see me hiding in a bathroom, unable to eat in front of other people. You can see me turning the lights out to kiss a girl. You can see me putting on white lipstick, chapstick, because I wanted my mouth to be smaller. So if you can't think up interesting scenes for your movie or your television show, you got to go into what wounded you and what you're doing in secret to compensate for that. We all have secret lives and they're all about compensating for our wounds. That's the action that will make a great story, whether it's film or television. And a lot of writers just don't know what to say. What does my character do next? Look at your wounds. We all have 10 or 12 and they will guide you into actually making and manufacturing compelling scenes. 2015, what are some of the film or even television shows that are out where there's some very deeply wounded, fascinating people? That okay, best to example, True Detective season one. Um, and I think television, by the way, is 80% of our business now as story consultants. Five years ago it was 80% movies. Why has TV become this explosive golden age? Uh, and it's because now there are no constraints on what you can see in sex, what you can say. Television has no more rules. So what you saw in a, in a story like True Detective is what I call going from saving a cat to killing the cat. Because that's where we are now. We are, we are constructing dark heroes that people want to watch. Why do people want to watch dark heroes? Because nobody's all good and nobody's all bad. And that's part of why superhero movies are failing, because that's not us. We all know, as people, that we are not only good, we're also bad. And so killing the cat simply means showing us dark heroes who are like us. We can accept that. We couldn't 20, 30 years ago. Television was just about good people and really bad people. Well, now television has become more like the Russian novel of the late 19th century, where Tolstoy was writing where people aren't good or bad. Everybody's a villain and everyone's a hero. So this dark hero is more like us, okay? So in True Detective, first year, we had two heroes. We had Matthew McConaughey and we had um, uh, uh, Woody Harrelson. And these two guys were both deeply wounded but one of them had taken their wounds and decided that they were just going to live in a happy place. And the other one had taken his wound, which was his child had been killed, and he decided the world was horrible and dark and meaningless. And so for an entire year, we watched these two guys bicker and argue with each other. And what the argument was really about was, is the world a horrible, meaningless place? Or is it a place of just love and happiness where we all can live? And that argument between those two guys was really made up the interesting part of this whole story. Because we all believe really the world's both. That it's got poison in it and it's also got good in it. But that's why this dark hero is becoming what we all want to see. Breaking Bad, the dark hero. Um, really, The Sopranos, Mad Men. Um, these are all examples of dark heroes. And that's what television is really full of right now. Wally and the Beaver today would be considered, would it be Eddie Haskell that we would want to watch? What was interesting about Wally and the Beaver was when it came out, it was the first television show to really show kids as not just these perfect little perky kids. They actually argued with each other. For then, that was, they were dark heroes. Both Wally and the Beaver, because the other shows were like um, uh, the Donna Reed show and stuff, kids were just automatons. So story is marching towards 
more and more realistic ideas of what we are as human beings. And none of us are real heroes and none of us are real villains. We're all a mixture. But the core wounds in True Detective were about thinking that the world is an awful place because Matthew McConaughey's character had lost his kid and Woody Harrelson's character didn't, didn't feel lovable. So he put on a happy face, but he didn't connect to anybody really in his life either. So it's a love story between these two guys. And as dark heroes, they come together and rescue each other in the end and form the only real bond they've ever had in their life with each other. And this buddy relationship is, comes out of their darkness and their dark places. And I just wanted to amplify on something Ceci said, which is that I think part of the reason Nick Pizzolatto, who's a genius, had a, had a second season of True Detective that wasn't fabulous, this last one, is he listened to his critics. His critics all said, you know what, Nick, he can't write women characters. He's just had Woody and Matt, and that's all he had. So this season, I think Nick listened to that, and he tried to write really great female characters, but he, he, he lost his focus, and so the story was so dark, and the, all, all the guys died, and they all died tragically. He had a real tragic ending this season, but I, I think it was because he listened to, and I think he'll tell you this, he listened to the critics that were, that were criticizing his vision of the first season. It's deadly to listen to criticism at the wrong point. It's just deadly. It never serves us well. And so when, we are, when, we're, when we're thinking and cooking and loving our story, the last thing we want to hear is a criticism of it. It takes us away from our story. And I think you have to be very careful about who you listen to. Five years ago, there were about 150 scripted shows on American television. Now there's over 300. That's an explosion. And there are new production companies on the internet, pop, all these new, hell, Overstock.com has decided to start a television production company, right? So what you see in the next year or two is an additional hundred feature, written features coming into television. I tell my students, even if you're a snob and you only love movies, all the tools we teach you work in television too. The only difference is, in movies, your heroes heal. In television, they just keep bleeding. But every other tool we give you works great on television. So try TV. Because look at all the fantastic stories television is telling right now. And it's, the market's only getting bigger. So I think that television is, because there's no more rules about what you have to say, because there's no more uh, strictures. Hell, I got a note. I was working with a great writer uh, a few months ago on a, on a TV show. And he sent in the pilot. We'd worked on it together. And we got a note back from the producer. And, and here's what the note said. I've never seen this ever before. The note said, can you make it longer? I'd never received that note ever. He wanted the pilot to be two and a half hours long. And he also said, he'd make it darker too. Now, this would have never been said five years ago because television story was very strictured. And you're going to tell it, you know, it's 45 minutes for an hour. You know, maybe in cable you could go to an hour. But all those rules are gone. So television is taken what the movies used to have exclusively and added the fact that now we can tell endless stories that go on for hours and hours and hours. And it's great, it'll work, people will support it. So this is why television works so well um, for, for our age. And I, I don't think there's any, I don't think that's gonna stop. I think it's gonna continue. So we teach a lot more television now than we do movies. How Movies Work has now changed its name? Yeah, we're now University of Story because of TV. <laughs> okay. Because we used to just teach movies, um, and we realized that was limiting. Um, so when we made the transition, 
we brought all of our genre tools into showing how these thing, same things work in television. For instance, Breaking Bad is a thriller. So all the rules of thrillers that you might have had in, I don't know, a mystery thriller, L.A. Confidential, and, and by the way, True Detective is a mystery thriller too. So all the rules of not showing the villain, of good news, bad news, of ticking clocks, all the genre tools that we used in mystery thrillers, three plots, one plot's hidden behind the other, all that stuff applies to True Detective. All the thriller rules of suspense, and uh, making uh, an, an anti-hero sympathetic by making everyone around him worse. All of that applies to Breaking Bad. So you just stretch the form and use the tools. So we could no longer say it's how movies work. So we thought, well, this is just not how TV works either. It's how story works. And by the way, all of these things we teach work in novels too. They work in books. They work anywhere there's a narrative form. We have a structural tool called the BMOC, which is beginning, middle, obstacle, and climax. These are the four points in any great story where the hero's asked to change. And they're in every great story, whether it's Star Wars, or The Fault in Our Stars, or uh, uh, um, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. And these four points also work inside every scene. They're in every action sequence, this BMOC. So this rhythm of story, is present in all great stories. So we have a lot of novelists now. And they're, you know, they aren't even novelists who want to necessarily translate their story to television movies, although a lot of them are. But this BMOC pattern transforms their novels. It transforms their story. We have a music video guy who's come in to study with us because this BMOC form works in six minute music videos too. So. And so do all the tools of structure and suspense. So it's all one thing. I mean, I know that sounds very countercultural, but it is. It's all one thing. It's just one rhythm. Just like a pop song, no matter how cool or hipster, has a chorus, a bridge, a verse, structure, right? Kanye does, and you know, uh, Ry Cooter does. They all do. Why? Because the human brain is wired to have a certain set of beats in any narrative form. And that's what we talk about, this BMOC structure. It works always. Bad stories, by the way, don't have this. And that's part of why they're bad. Most movies are bad. Most television is bad. And it's applying the tools properly that makes part of what makes the stories great. It's simple, but unless you're conscious of it, you won't do it. If you don't have good news, bad news, raising stakes, and, and, and uh, uh, ticking clocks, on every page of your story, your story's gonna be boring. But hardly anyone teaches that. Uh, and being conscious of how those tools work is how you start putting them on every page. And by the way, these suspense tools work in drama, they work in romantic comedy, they work in every genre, and they work in television, too. So each page of a script has to have those elements? It's better if it does, yes. If you go and look at a Tarantino script, or you go and look at a Chris Nolan script, or you go and look at a Lynn script, you will see on every page, once you've been shown it, that every page has ticking clocks, every page has good news, bad news, every page has raising stakes. A lot of them have other suspense tools too, but writers are often unaware of this consciously. They don't build this into their stories when they write them. So just being aware that this is how, and they're cheap tricks, by the way. It's good news, uh, uh, I'm giving you 20 bucks. Bad news, I'm slapping you. Uh, ticking clocks is just a bomb, a, a bomb ticking down. It's a gun pointed at someone. These are not sophisticated tricks, they're simple, but the greatest artists use them in all of their best work. You've never seen a Tarantino script that didn't have three or four pointed guns in nearly every scene. It's cheap and it works like a charm. It entertains and that's why we also see these in television. Breaking Bad is nothing but a series of excruciating suspense devices, so excruciating I couldn't even get Ceci to watch it. 
And when you sit down to watch Breaking Bad, you often have to stop because it's so repellently uh, tension making. But that's what makes it great. Oh, can I say, can I say oh, one other thing? Oh, please do, please do. Okay. Uh, about superheroes. Television has finally given us a good superhero. It's Daredevil. Now they've tried many others and it hasn't worked. Why does Daredevil work? Because Daredevil has a great fault. He has a great core wound and we see it at the beginning. He was blinded when he was a little kid, blinded by a chemical spill. Now what this means is when he fights crime, he's enormously wounded. He can't see anything. So his superpower is compensation for that wound just as it is in any great story. How does he compensate? By becoming so able to sense anything in the, in the air moving, in the way he's in the space, that he's become powerful because of his wound, because of his blindness. So Daredevil has succeeded as a television superhero because of that. And there'll be more of them. But once again, it's about a guy's personal wound. Writing a flawed character for television versus movies, realizing we need to keep that what's their core wound and why do they act out of that as the basis of kind of everything they do. What's the difference between the TV version of this flawed character and the movie version? The TV will, this character will never actually heal. He'll just keep bleeding. There's a great show called The Newsroom. Um, Aaron Sorkin probably got sick of the network and he, and he quit making it great. But the first year, it's great because Jeff Daniels is this wounded newspaper guy. And he's been wounded by the girl who comes in in the pilot to come back into his life. And what Mackenzie tells him in the pilot is, because Jeff Daniels is playing a guy who's long ago become a corporate whore. He's like, the, he calls himself the Jay Leno of news because he never wants to be controversial. He just says what he has to say to keep the ratings up. But he's been wounded by this girl who left him three years ago. And we're never told why. But she was the soul and spirit of good journalism. She believed that journalism should be like what it was here in the 60s, where Walter Cronkite told us the truth about our society. And that's all gone now. So Jeff Daniels is wounded per professionally because he has to become a corporate whore every night on the newscast. And he gets good ratings. And he's wounded personally by McKinsey having left him. She comes back in the pilot and says to him, I know you're pissed. I know you're pissed because I left you and you're right to be pissed. But you know what? You've become a whore and I want you to become a great newscaster again. And I'm going to help you because she's a producer. Now, Jeff Daniels in this pilot, he's furious with her. He says to her, you, we screwed up. I trusted you. He's so angry he can't even sit down. Now, this wound, if it was a movie, by the end of the hour and a half story, he and Mackenzie would have reconciled. She would have not only helped him professionally, because she does, she helps him put on a newscast that actually is truthful and good and valiant and virtuous again. But they would also personally probably either come together or split apart, one or the other, depending on whether you were making a happy ending or a tragedy. But in television, that ending is just, well, I think I love you. I'll see you next week. So those wounds don't heal, they just keep bleeding. So in television, what replaces the healing of this heart, of this wound, is character surprise. Something new comes out of the character you'd never seen come out of them before. In Jeff Daniels' character, he surprises us by deciding, damn it, I am gonna put on a good newscast. I am. He's, we're surprised at the very beginning of the show when he bursts out at Northwestern in this panel and says, we're crap. We're not number one. America's not number one. We, we suck. So in television, this wound just continues to bleed for five years. I mean, how long did Grey on Grey's Anatomy want to get married? I think 10 years. I think she finally got married year 10. I think she's divorced again. So television gives us characters who actually are a lot more like us in real life. And I think that's another reason TV is powerful in a way, is that we don't heal generally all in, in a month or two months. It's a lifelong process. So wounding and bleeding is kind of the way we go through life. So television shows us 
in a way, in a way, there's more depth in television than in movies, although movies has, have, have real depth too. But we can see week after week facets and surprises of characters that we would never have time to see in a movie, right? The depth of, of Walter White's uh, uh, turns, uh, the depths of uh, the turns we get in Mad Men, the way Don Draper, by the way, is a guy who in the first episode is running away from a wonderful wife and a family into the arms of another woman. What's he doing the last season? He's running away from a love of a wonderful woman and a family. He doesn't really change. Why do we want to watch him? Because he keeps surprising us. Well, he's got a new wife. Oh, certainly he's going to be happy now, yes, season four. No, he's going to go start banging the upstairs neighbor who's not even particularly compelling or attractive. Why? Because of his core wound. Don Draper's core wound is, I'm unlovable. And we see that when we watch how his mom died and he was raised by this woman who hated him, an abusive father too. Now, what do you do when you're unlovable, when that's your core wound? What is the behavior and the compensation that comes out of that? Well, for Don Draper, it's, I'm going to become incredibly seductive. I'm going to be incredibly handsome and charming. I'm going to make a ton of money. I'm going to be the most suave, sophisticated guy you could ever meet so I can just seduce freaking great amount of women, which he does. But what happens to you when you have that wonderful woman and that love, but your core wound is I'm unlovable? What happens then? We see it with Don. Wait a minute. You love me? You want to be with me? What's wrong with you? Get away from me. I want her. I have to pursue her. And we see all that in season one episode pilot. And we see that through the entire series. Don trying to change and not really being able to. And that sustains the entire show. His core wound literally drives every episode of the entire story. And this is what core wounds always do. This is why it's the nuclear reactor of a great character. Peter, what makes a good story? Embarrassment. Um, truth. Ask yourself, and you can do it alone in a room, write down on a piece of paper the 10 most horribly embarrassing things, secrets, in your life you would never want anyone ever to know. Now, we all have them. You write down 10 of them. You don't ever want to show this to anybody. You don't have to. But those 10 embarrassing personal secrets will fuel almost all the stories you're ever going to tell in your life. Because every story you tell is going to come out of one of those horrible embarrassments because they are what's wounded you. And they start when you're little. And it's usually our parents who wound us. Sometimes it's a dirty old uncle, you know, it, it, sometimes it's a neighbor, but it's usually our parents. So if you can understand what those wounds are, you're going to be able to write 10 compelling characters, all having behaviors that are compensations for that wound. Uh, like I said, mine, one of mine was my mommy didn't love me, but it came out in body dysmorphia. Yeah, that won't be the case for you. The one wound I'm unlovable, Look how it worked for Don Draper. He became Mr. Handsome. He, everything he did was seductive, yes? So that's a difference because everyone's different in how they react to the core wound. So um, I, this is the most potent way to tell a great story. And it's about character. You know, Blake Snyder wrote a great book called Saving the Cat, but he didn't talk much about character. And so this lecture I gave yesterday, which was killing the cat, is sort of like, what else you need to know about story if you want to write a compelling story today? Character is something that it seems like a black box for a lot of writers. So I'm suggesting, what's more interesting about your life than what happened to you? Your secrets. If you can't get interested in your own secrets, you're going to write a boring character. Well, he's got to do this. Or you see uh, sometimes teachers go, well, here's a list of things. Uh, write down a list of, of, of character attributes. Oh, they like tea. They like, I don't know, diapers. It seems so arbitrary, right? Who cares? 
Think about your own wound and what you like, what you avoided, and what you still avoid. And I guarantee you, you're like, geez, can I really say that? I don't want to reveal that about myself. Well, you're going to have a boring story if you don't. And even writers that are very successful who tell me, oh, Peter, I never do any of that crap. You know, I, I'm completely unanalyzed and I don't need analysis. One page of their script reveals all of that damage, whether they want it to or not. It's right there. It's what they write about. Flawed character versus a train wreck, or is that what we want to see? Yeah, we want to see everybody train wrecked. Mm -hmm. um, you, you want to see everybody in a room grappling with their flaws. I mean, in a, in a story like Mad Men, everybody had a deep core wound. Peggy's core wound is she's a, she's a woman in a man's world, but she thinks like a man. She was damaged deeply. Um, Joan has this deep core wound. I'm only a sex object, right? And that, and by the way, these didn't heal, right? At the end of the show, she's still dealing with, Joan's still dealing with the fact that she essentially whored herself out with this uh, car executive and, and is not taken seriously by men, yes? They never heal. But it is the core wounds that when they bump up against each other in the story that makes you want to watch them. And audiences never need to know this. But if you ask yourself why a character is interesting you're looking at, it's almost always because of that. How are they bleeding, right? The other thing Don did because he was unlovable is he made up an entire story about who he was. He took someone else's identity, yeah? He took the identity of a guy who was killed in Korea. Again, I'm not lovable. I couldn't be loved for me. I got to be somebody else. So it's always there in a great story. There's never a story that it's not in. Now, this probably wasn't true 20 years ago, but we've become a more sophisticated audience in the United States. We really do uh, want depth of character that we didn't need 20 years ago, and that's only going to continue. Stories, and a story like Louie, which is a television series with this great comic, it's nothing but him bleeding every week in surprising ways, confessing things that sort of make our teeth be set on edge, but it's compelling to watch someone confess. Confession is riveting. Whenever I confess a personal wound of mine in a classroom, everybody's going, I've been talking a long time, everyone just stops. There's total silence in the room. They're looking at me. They want to know. And this is why you can't lie about your core wound, because that's what people want to do. Oh, geez, I can't say the truth, so I'm going to make something up. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, okay. My mom molested me when I was four. You can't make it up. Why? Because we have infinitely good bullshit detectors as audiences. We will know. I can always tell in a story when someone's telling me something that isn't true or isn't their experience. We know immediately. You've got to tell the truth or audiences will be bored. So whatever your pain is, you can't lie. It's the truth that makes people want to watch you. Why do we love confessions? Why do we, why? Well, we're, what is it let me ask life? you, what's your deepest, most personal embarrassing secret? I'll tell you when the camera's on. <laughs> there's there's exactly. more than one. Uh, exactly. But if you were to tell me now, I would love hearing it. Why? My only sense would be because then you could measure your own against what I'm telling That's you. That's right. And then go, I guess I'm not that bad after all, maybe. Only, or, I'm not alone. Okay. I'm, you're, in, you're in pain. So am I. Now I understand you. Now I empathize with you. Now you're, you're like me. Now it's a story about me. It's not some wonderful person who's leading a perfect life that I might fantasize about and enjoy as a reality show um, or a Kardashian show, but it's the deeper part of our lives, which is, I'm in pain. I, I, I don't have everything I want. Are you like me? Oh my God, you are? Thank you. Now I'll follow you because if you can get better, I can get better. Empathizing with the character is all about confession. If you'll notice in a great story, confession of your core wound or showing the core wound is something that happens 
almost immediately in great stories. You want to show the character's wound and his compensation often in the first 10 minutes of the show. In a movie, that's certainly true. The quicker you show it, the better the empathy will be for it, for the audience. Don't hide it. Make everything, and every scene's about it. Every scene's about the core wound and about how you're either curing it or making it worse. And every character in a movie is only ripping at the wound or healing it. That's all it is. Movies are just, uh, think, of, uh, think of a movie story as a, 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 a boxing ring and the hero jumps into the ring, but he's bleeding. He starts out bleeding. And the whole movie is just people jumping in with bandages to help him heal or people jumping in with knives to rip it wider open. In a television story, that just continues for season after season. But it's the same thing. Flawed male characters versus flawed female characters, how are they different? I think that male characters uh, are the only thing I can speak about with great accuracy. Uh, I, I don't think there's a sex-based distinction between the two. I think, however, I believe women are, are generally more physically afraid of the world and if you're going to write a great female character, you need to understand that women walk around scared a lot of the time. Most men don't understand that. If you want to write a great character that's not your sex, you've got to somehow learn about that sex. Just as I think a lot of women writers don't write great male characters because we are very different. So the best writers on television, Matt Weiner, um, Matt Weiner writes great female characters. He obviously understands who they are. And then you have another side of it. There are some writers, I'm not going to name them, who write fantastic shows um, about the Old West or whatever, and, and their male characters are extremely well realized, but the women are basically, they're either whores or they're, they're, they're vehicles for, for what they say. I don't think most, I think most writers can do one or the other really well. I think Matt Weiner does them both really well. It's a question of understanding the other sex. And most writers have difficulty empathizing with, with, with people that aren't like themselves. And again, this is why core wounds matter, because you cannot, as a writer, if you don't empathize and really understand the character you're writing about, you're going to write a cliché. And I think that some writers simply specialize in, in either female or male. And I love that the female characters that, that Weiner shows us have a depth and a vulnerability that, that I don't think even a great writer, okay, I'm going to say it. I mean, I think David Milch is, is a fabulous writer. Huh? <laughs> I think he's, he's a genius, a Shakespearean genius. But I think his male characters have a, a, a sort of a... a, of a of, of a depth and a believability that um, I don't know that he, he always brings to women. It doesn't really matter because his, his worlds are so great. And then you pick the world that you're going to be able to, to, to render. The Old West is a man's world, okay? So that's, that's a good place for him to be. Uh, Matt Weiner's world, the uh, early 60s, is a man's world with women coming into it. So that's a good world for him to be in. How do we know if we've written a cliche? Uh, people will not be interested in the character and they will write you a note like, he's not sympathetic. Whenever you get a note like, he's not sympathetic, what it really means is he's not believable. Why are we sympathetic to a character? Because we understand him. That's why confession's important. But having sympathy for a character, we can sympathize with a complete a-hole. But it has to be believable, right? So when somebody gives you a note, character's not sympathetic, don't understand, what they're really saying is they're boring. Again, figure out why they're acting the way they do and look at why they're damaged. Give yourself five ways a character is compensating 
for their wound. That's always a way to make them believable, to make them deep. So we hear this term a lot, develop a character. What does that mean? And how can a screenwriter work on their characters? They do it by really understanding what the character's bleeding from. Uh, it's always about that. Uh, it, it, as I said, there's a great character in um, uh, uh, Breaking Bad that is Walter's nemesis. He's his brother-in-law, Hank. He's this blowhard, he's an alpha male, uh, and, and he is Walter's opposite. He's his scourge. And, and the way we develop characters in a story is they all have to either be ripping at the wound of the hero or healing him. Which is it for each character? And you gotta decide which side the, the character's on, and then you have to ask yourself, why is he a blowhard? In, in terms of this guy's uh, character, in terms of Hank, why is he so interested in being a big deal? Well, his wound is that he doesn't matter, that he's not a parent. He's actually jealous of Walt's fact that he, Walt has a family. And so in his desire to um, dominate Walt, all of that is part of it. But you know, there's a huge element of simple arbitrary surprise involved in this. Vince Gilligan says he didn't know who he was gonna have in his story when he did the pilot. He was gonna kill off Jesse. He wasn't gonna have Hank. When you see the story and you, you understand how great a character is, in commercial television especially, you can change it. You can say, oh, well, he's, this is a guy who I really want to explore. This is a character I really want to develop because of the relationship he had with Walt works so well. Often, and this is why I, I sound like a broker, but television is such a cool medium, is that you can change a lot of stuff in TV. You can't really do it in the movies. You can do it to some extent. But in television, the pilot gets done. You look at it, you go, oh my God, look at that, look at this. This is a storyline. These two characters mesh in a way that I think we need to explore. Movies can only do that maybe once. You get it, you go, okay, geez, we can reshoot maybe. If we have enough money, we can reshoot once. But television gives you that capability to do week after week, even year after year, you can bring in new characters. So the development process in television is really almost hey, I can put it up and see how it works. You know, in movies, people all, always think, they go to a movie, if you live out in Iowa, you go to the movie and you watch a movie and it's bad. And you say to yourself, Hollywood's so stupid. It's full of so many stupid people. Look at how crappy this movie is. I knew in two minutes this was a crappy movie. They must be complete idiots out there to put this stuff out. I'm gonna go out there and make a bundle, because look at this. Well, here's, of course, the truth. When they made the movie, when they shot the movie, when the movie was already on the cards and they saw it, they knew they had a crappy movie too. But it was too late to change. You'd already shot it. The budgets weren't going to allow you to reshoot it or change it, right? So it's very easy when you see a finished product to go, oh, that's crap. What only an idiot would have made that? But in television, you get the chance to see what you've done and go, oh, I can change it. We're going to shoot a whole new story next week. And, uh, oh, Jesse, I love him. Let's put him in the show. Oh, Hank, he's a great character. Let's have him in there, too. Gilligan will tell you, he didn't know 90% of where Walt was going to go when he first wrote this pilot. It is only by seeing it and then going, oh yeah, that's what we have, that he could develop all these characters. And that's part of what makes TV such a great medium too. You get do-overs. You get do-overs a lot of the time. And movies don't do that, although I think movies should do that. And we get called in as story doctors now sometimes because it's so much cheaper to shoot a movie than it used to be that they're beginning to do the same thing. It's like, wow, we got all this in the can, but we could shoot again. We don't have any big stars. We could bring everybody back. The production costs aren't that high. The movies are, are becoming a little bit more like the TV development process because of that. 
because characters can change and, and we can do a reshoot, not for $10 million now, but for maybe half a million. So let's change the movie up. So the two mediums are interestingly becoming uh, 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 more similar because of technology uh, in a way. So that's a development question that really is driven by technology. I, Because I, I think I already answered how you develop a character in terms of his core wound. That's really always the place to start. But when you can see an actor inhabit the character, you really, and a particular actor, can change a character immensely. There's a movie called Heat, uh, Michael Mann. And, and Heat is a movie, and the two uh, protagonists are uh, uh, um, Robert De Niro and um, Al Pacino. Now, someone made Heat before Heat. It was, I think, an English uh, movie. I may be wrong. Was English. But with two actors, and, they, and they, they, in this scene, it was the exact same scene that was shot. Uh, the, all the same words, all the same dialogue between, but instead of Pacino and De Niro, it was these two other actors. Now, if you go and look at those two scenes, both same dialogue, I think even similar camera angles, the one between the two actors I won't name is flat as a board. You're just like, okay. The one between uh, Pacino and De Niro is electric. It's amazing. So never underestimate how you're going to, the, the energy that actors bring to a scene is immense. And I think story snobs, and I can be one sometimes, think, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you, you as the auteur, you create the whole story. If the story's in there, it doesn't matter. That's not true. So you develop a story based sometimes on specific actors, and specific actors can change your entire conception of your story once you see them do the scene. That heat is a great example of how actors develop and bring an enormous energy to, to, to roles that two other actors would absolutely not be able to do. And there's a shot-by-shot -shot remake, by the way, of, of a famous Hitchcock movie, um, Psycho. And the guy who remade it did it shot for shot, line by line. And it's very uncompelling. <laughs> very uncompelling. And part of it is because the actors and also there's tiny little differences in timing, like ticking clocks and good news, bad news. Tiny little differences. Carrie is another example. De Palma did it, and then somebody else did it. And when you look at the two side by side, you'll see that the actors are different, and there's tiny little differences in ticking clock timings and sequences, but one falls completely flat. Do you think that the timing has been sped up in recent films? Or is that just my own bias? It's interesting. In the carry example, the, the timing is actually, uh, there's, the ticking clock time is actually lessened, but that actually makes it boring, uh, more boring, because he doesn't draw out the tension. He doesn't really, and he's a great director and a great creator, but I'm just saying in terms of developing the story and developing the characters, tiny little differences in timing uh, uh, and, and again, who's playing the part make a huge, huge difference. Right. I'm thinking of when Carrie would go back home yeah. and she would walk in the house and yes. there was this cloud that was looming over. Yes. And at first she wouldn't know what to expect and so you would be in that moment of suspense waiting to see how is mother going to react? Yes, and mother, I think, played by Piper Laurie. Oh, She's amazing. amazing, right? And that's an actress who's sort of bringing that electricity to that role. So as a writer, we really want to leave uh, 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 that space in the development process for a particular actor to come in and see it. And, and, and you know, obviously this is true, but uh, when you write with, I always say, hey, if you've got a particular actor in mind, write with that actor in mind if it energizes you. Um, because actors can mesmerize and completely change the development of a character, their energy, what they bring to it. Thinking of like a Melissa Leo or a Robin yeah. Wright. Yeah. They can really just come in and, and just with their uncomfortable silences or looks or just body, you know, just something and just really 
change it and make it from flat to three dimensional. Power of Star is immense. It's misused in Hollywood because people say, hey, you know, I'll get so and so for the movie. It, the currency of development is I've got Matthew McConaughey, therefore you're going to make $100 million. You don't even need to know the script, right? That's what sometimes they tell the money guys. Well, there's some truth to that. But Matthew McConaughey can also be really bad in a horrible story. But if, if the reason stars are still the currency in Hollywood, although less than they used to be, is they really can bring an electricity to a part that you're simply not going to be able to have without them. So I always say, write with Matthew McConaughey in mind, or write with uh, Woody Harrelson in mind, and, and that'll probably help you and inspire you in your story, even if you don't wind up getting them. They do bring an enormous power to a story. It's, it's false for a, a writer to say, you know, I don't care who plays the part. Um, this is about the story, not the, not the star property. Managers and agents aren't idiots. So the fact that they're always talking in terms of stars is because stars really do matter. They can completely transform a project. I think the energy between Harrelson and McConaughey McConaughey uh, in, in True Detective was a, a big piece of why that show worked so well. Peter, where do you see writers struggling the most? They don't, especially beginning writers, don't realize um, how long the process is going to take. Um, that's, that's really uh, it. Um, you know, John Wells said, I wish someone had told me how long it was going to take when I started being a writer. Um, and uh, I deal with a lot of beginners um, on one hand, and then we also deal with studio writers on the other. So I sort of see it from both sides. Uh, but beginners think, and maybe that's good for them to think, man, I'm going to write this, and in six months it's going to get sold, and I'm going to be famous. And maybe that energizes someone as a writer, and I'm all for that. But the truth is, the average writer um, it takes years and years and years before your first show is going to be bought, let alone put on. Now, this is not a truth that I think a lot of beginning writers want to hear. And I don't talk about it a lot because it can be discouraging. But it isn't really, if you think about it. Um, the idea that you are going to write something and sell it in six months is, is 99% of the time not true. Uh, this is a difficult craft. It's a difficult art. Um, it's just as hard as being a brain surgeon. Maybe, actually, I think it's a lot harder. And so how long does it take to be a brain surgeon, right? And then you'll, on the, sometimes you'll have a client say to me, hey, Peter, I just want to write one script. So just give me a little two-week course. And that's like saying, hey, you know what? I want to do just one brain surgery. So just give me the basics, right? So I can do the brain surgery. But this is how people think. I only know one guy who sat down and wrote a, a script and it became a big hit. And immediately, he was a stand-up comic. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the writers who, are, who succeed, it takes years. And so what do you do in those years? Well, you can be really unhappy and feel like you're a failure. And that's what most writers end up doing, right? And they have other jobs, and they feel they're never to succeed, and their parents tell them they're idiots, and their cousins laugh at them. Hey, I've got a house. What are you, still out there in Hollywood? Oh, you know, what a loser. So the process, and, and the other idea is that, you know, if you're over 22 as a television writer, you're failed. Listen, every successful TV writer I know is in his 30s or 40s, often 50s, though they won't admit it, um, because there's still that myth. But, and there are a few, uh, they do hire really guys and girls uh, in their early 20s and even below for certain youth-oriented shows, but that's uh, a slot. Most writers, most, it takes at least 10 years before you really get good at your craft. Is that something you want to put on your book when you're selling your book? No. You know, write your story, you know, in 10 years. <laughs> How about that, right? Write a script in 10 years. Oh, geez, yeah, I'm going to take that. I'm going to buy that book. Just 10 years? Great. 
No, it's write it in a week, right? Or network your way, right? There, there's a lot of people who sell the idea of access, right? Hey, I'm going to put you in the same room with agents and managers, and that's all you need, buddy. You just haven't been in the right room. Okay, they get in the room, they hand them the script, the script sucks, they've got no gig, right? So selling access is, and I know, and I think I said this last year, but it bears repeating. If you write a good story, people will pound your door down to buy it. You won't have to worry about being represented. You won't have to worry about being in a room with other people. You will get your story sold if it's good. Conversely, you can have every connection in the world. And if your story's bad, you're just going to get no's. So patience and what Ceci was talking about earlier with the idea that you got to get comfortable with the fact that you haven't got what you want yet and you have to be at ease and secure that your vision is a good one. Um, I see the, the, the level of, of, of surety and confidence I see in almost every successful writer and some of it's pathological. I don't know that it's been earned and <laughs> maybe just sheer narcissism, but the level of confidence that they have a story worth telling is amazingly high. This is part of their success. They simply don't stop. They continue to fail, but they don't stop. That's the key. You're going to fail and fail and fail. I think Churchill said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. And I really believe that's true, especially in Hollywood. This is a difficult, difficult art. It's a lot easier to be a doctor. It's a lot easier to be a lawyer. Go do those things if you want to do that. But it's a 10 year graduate program. Unless you're William Shakespeare, there's like 0.01% of people this doesn't apply to. I've never met them. I've never run into them as a story consultant. Everybody I know, and I know and work with a lot of very successful writers, they all took at least 10 years. So in commercial fiction like Gone Girl, um, they changed it significantly to make it more of a thriller. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the book version, uh, ben Affleck's not who he is in, in, in the cinematic version. And the, the woman isn't either. In, in, the, in the movie, the woman is a supervillain. She's, and, and Ben Affleck is this tragic hero who at the BMOC points is asked to change, to step up, to rescue her, um, and to sort of assert his manhood. And in the movie, he fails to do this at all the points uh, of the BMOC. He just doesn't, and in the end, she wins. She manipulates him so much that when she gets out of that car all bloody and embraces him um, in front of the press, he just says, you fucking bitch. But he doesn't challenge it. In fact, her version of the whole thing becomes accepted, and he's going to be stuck for the next 20 years living with the monster, right? Now, you, you probably imagine what's going to happen. She's probably going to kill him in a year or two. But that's the end of the movie. Now, the book doesn't do that. So we teach these genre uh, tools. So when you're converting a literary book into a Hollywood movie, you use the same genre tools that you use if you were uh, buying a script from uh, a, a dope fiend uh, uh, a <laughs> kid in Hollywood. It, you, you, it's a commercial art form, and, and the way I say that it is, you know a, a vanity license plate uh, in California of a lot. You, you've got seven letters uh, to make something funny or something uh, good, uh, and that's a commercial art form. You have a frame, and you've got to fit your story into this frame. In fact, that's the, the, the delight is to see that it fits into this frame. Um, for instance, if you had, okay, you got seven letters. So I saw a Corvette uh, last year and the, and the vanity plate said three inches, all right? So that's funny, right? Like this guy has a small penis. Now, if you had 30 letters or 300 letters to make this same point, it wouldn't be funny, right? So it, a commercial art form like a Hollywood movie or a Hollywood television show 
is a frame you have to learn to fit your letters into in a way that makes it delightful for the audience. The cool part is television has kind of expanded that frame and, and you can do more unusual stuff in television. But movies, I think we had just as many movies made last year as ever. Um, movies also have extraordinary power and they're not gonna go away. Uh, movies aren't, aren't dying. I mean, people have been said they're dying since the 20s. They're still here. Because, but, but what's interesting to me is that television now tells stories in 10 minute little sequence beats and that's about our attention span when we're watch when we're on uh, on our computers. I'll even watch a television show like Breaking Bad for ten minutes, and then I'll turn it off, and I'll go surf or I'll do something else. I'll come back and watch another ten minute piece, and then I'll go surf and do. And I even watch movies a lot like that now. Our attention span is getting shorter and shorter, and television sort of uh, fits that bite sized. Uh, 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 storytelling sensibility almost better than movies. We sometimes now sort of uh, get uh, sort of distracted if we're sitting there watching a movie for an hour and a half. Um, so you always want to construct your movies in these little eight or nine minute sequences anyway, but television has sort of supercharged that. Um, and we now can watch TV uh, uh, for a few minutes and then go watch something else and then come back to it. But books are always going to make fabulous uh, uh, movies because the characterization uh, level in a book is usually much deeper and stronger than in a screenplay. There's more time to describe the person. Uh, there's more situations. There's more depth to that book characterization than there was to a movie script. Movie scripts tend to scant on that characterization a little bit. So we left off on the part where I asked about why certain novels um, and their fictionalized characters are not able to become movies, I believe. Yeah, well, we were talking about a literary function, a literary book uh, is all about the interior mind of someone. That's very difficult to turn into a visual story. Uh, but commercial fiction like Gone Girl, I mean, that's always going to make great movies. But again, it has to fit the genre. We teach a lot of novelists, and we, we tell them, frankly, look, we're going to fit you into this commercial structure of what we call the BMOC, which is um, the character is going to be asked to change in these crescendos at this point, at this point, at this point, at this point. Now, if you don't want to do that, that's cool. But what you're going to get from that is a character who changes, and a character who changes visibly. <laughs> and this is amazing. We've had novelists who are literary novelists um, come in and they don't really want to be there. Their agents have, have asked them to come to, to, cha to change their story. But when they understand the rhythm of a commercial movie, they go, you know what, this actually improved my my, my protagonist, I, I, I was forced to try to understand what it is that I love about him. And the other thing is, I'm working with a young adult writer who's very, very successful and who has, uh, her books are taught in schools. Uh, and um, <laughs> and she's, she's very, very successful as a YA. But when she, she's trying to write a script, and when I ask her, okay, what's your character's core wound? Uh, who's teaching them? Who's healing them? Who's not? She was like, you know what? I don't know. I, you're right. I mean, there's a bunch of people in the book, but none of them really do that. And I don't know the answers to that question. And I'd like to know the answers. So <laughs> generally speaking, uh, novelists who, who we work with, that's the reaction they have. And, and if they don't have that reaction, I guess they don't tell us, they just slink away. Or they think, oh, those ho poor, awful Hollywood people. But our tools are designed to make you ask the questions, why does a character change? Or why does he not change? And, and what does he have to learn? And who's asking him to change? So um, it's basic stuff, but it's not the approach of a lot of novelists to ask these kinds of questions. I'm writing a tone poem or writing, I'm writing a narrative of a life. 
Um, yeah, so, so literary fiction, we work with it all the time, but we are going to ask them these questions. Peter, when should a screenwriter give up on a screenplay? <laughs> yeah, wow. That, wow. That's sort of like asking, when do you give up on a marriage? Because you can give up on a marriage at any point. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, uh, we've been to counseling. Okay, we thought that was going to work. Well, okay, do you want to go see another counselor or not? Um, there's no good answer to that, and I'm sorry to be mealy mouth because I've had writers who have had scripts that they haven't been able to sell in 15 years. They turn to them again, and they, they go, wow. I'd say if you are tired of the story, put it away and then come back to it in a year or two. It's amazing what happens when you do that. You, there's something about time that gives you a complete perspective and will help you maybe understand what's wrong with the story in 10 minutes, whereas you've been struggling with it and struggling with it and you can't realize what's wrong with it. I've seen writers put a story away for a year, come back to it and go, oh my God, I know exactly what's wrong with it. I know how to fix it. There, are, there is never a point for you to say, I will never ever touch the script again, ever. It's, if you've written something down, it's going to be valuable to you. It, it, I've seen it all the time happen that a writer has worked four or five years on a project and said, I will never touch it again, picked it up uh, e even four or five years later and been re-inspired by it. And here's the other thing. When you're writing a, a story and you read it the next day, you're the worst judge of whether it's good or not of anybody. You should, and I always tell writers this, Try not to read your writing for at least a week or two when you're writing it. Try to get some perspective on it. Chances are what you've written is, has some brilliance in it, but you won't know. You have no perspective in a day or two. You need time to know whether it's good or not. This is why that cliche about working every day whether you are inspired or not it is so important and I see it in professional writers all the time. Even if they literally are in agony as they type and go, this is shit, this is crap, this is crap. You never know what the gold is going to be from that writing. Whereas if you don't write it down, if you go, you know what, today is just too tough. It's too hard. I have no inspiration. I'm not going to write because I know when I write this is crap. Those people fail almost all the time because they don't ever write on a disciplined schedule. So they're never, they don't have crap that they can go back in and go, oh look, here's a gold nugget. Oh, here's another gold nugget. I guarantee you if you write five pages of what you think is utter crap, that within that you'll find a paragraph, if you give yourself enough time, that'll literally propel you another chapter or two or another scene or two. And that's what, that's sort of the secret of a professional writer that really distinguishes him from an amateur writer is that they will write on a schedule no matter whether or not they've got needles sticking in their eyes. They'll just go ahead and sit down and write. Peter, writing a screenplay, does it begin with the word fade in? Uh, and not in my experience. It, it begins with the, the excitement of an idea. Uh, you know, Vince Gilligan said, you know, when he started Breaking Bad, it was just the idea. He was sitting around with a, a friend of his and they were bemoaning the fact that they weren't working. And he just goes, man, you know, maybe we should cook meth. And his friend laughed, ha, ha, ha. And then from that, he had the idea, wow, cooking meth, what would that be like? So the whole story came from this little nugget, this little excitement. Um, and I see that all the time with writers is, Whatever excites you is the place to start in your story. One deadly thing to do is to go, okay, well, hmm, what's selling? Let me go to the Hollywood Reporter and see what's selling right now. Okay, well, uh, horror is not selling, uh, 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 action selling. All right, I'll write an action movie. That is almost guaranteed to leave you uninspired. Um, I say write from excitement for a good week or month and then you'll run out of that excitement at some point, or you won't, 
Um, if you do run out of excitement, then you can watch or, or look at tools to help you, or you can just abandon the project. But I, I've never known a writer who, who wrote simply because they had to write, uh, especially starting a project. Obviously, if you're working on a spec script or if you're working for money in any way, you sit down on a disciplined schedule and you write. But to start creating a story that way, I, I've just never seen it happen. Excitement is the only key to telling a great story at the beginning. It's like dating or like a marriage. You'll know really quickly if there's any chemistry there. And if there isn't any chemistry there, it's probably going to fail. Um, but in any case, you, 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 you have to write on a schedule. I've never known a writer who didn't write on a schedule who, who succeeded, who just said, I'm just going to let inspiration carry me where it will. I've never seen a writer succeed doing it that way. I'm not saying you couldn't. I've just never seen it. Every writer I know that succeeds has a discipline about them. So included in that discipline, let's say every 10 hours a writer has per day to dedicate to a career. Of those 10, 10 hours, should they be doing various things like developing an idea, writing a screenplay, watching movies, which sometimes falls under the uh, fun part of doing research, which sometimes goes on forever and ever. But if we broke down 10 hours a professional writer should spend on something every day, what should the, that be? Most writers that I work with have a uh, uh, amount of pages per day they want to achieve. Um, but I think that's like asking how you make love. I mean, you, as long as you get your pages in the day, I think I, I, there's one writer I worked with who told me, Peter, nobody in the world can work at this more than two hours a day. If they say they are, they're lying. And, but I don't think that's true. I know other writers I've worked with who literally crank out the chapters on a disciplined basis. Uh, we just did a book um, from an English uh, woman who's a brilliant uh, writer, but she's a financial analyst. She turned her book into the publisher on time, and the publisher was aghast. Like, we, we never have that. Well, it's just she's used to actually having to produce stuff on a schedule. Um, I can't emphasize enough, though, that, that the discipline of a professional writer to go ahead and, and, and always fulfill the page count for the day is, it sounds mind-numbing, it sounds like working in a factory. I'm just observing those are the writers who succeed. I don't know why that is, but they are the writers who succeed. I have a deadline, I must produce, I'm producing it now. They all do that. Why is that? I don't know. Why do the ones that say, ah, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not inspired today, well, I'll, I'll just watch a movie, or I'll do something fun with research, and the inspiration will come. I don't know why those guys never finish their scripts. I don't know why. I'm not judging. I'm just observing who sells scripts and who doesn't. That's my observation. Uh, by the way, that was as, as a writer, that was always my problem. I simply couldn't commit to the page. I'm a wounded writer. The reason I do what I do is I started analyzing story years ago because I wanted to see how I could succeed as a writer. And then I got fascinated with story structure and analysis and tools and, and how the secrets all worked. And then I decided this is really kind of what I want to do. But I've just never seen a writer um, who was undisciplined uh, in the process succeed. And a scriptwriter like Ron Bass uh, once told me, he says, look, I get up at three in the morning and I work, uh, I work and work and work. I pace in my garage, I work. I, then I go back to my desk and I work. I think Ron said, you know, he works 12, 14 hours a day. Um, but he always gets his projects in on time. There's a discipline there. It's always, you know, you just want to observe who, who, who succeeds at it and doesn't, and then you just draw your own conclusions. Discipline seems key to me. Is discipline counterintuitive to being a creative, though? That's why creators go crazy. That's why they drink, is that it, it's two opposite things. Needing to fulfill 
a very rigorous disciplined structure and having the personality of a rebellious miscreant who hates convention and can't stand following the rules, right? Those two elements are often necessary for a, a creator and it's why creators are all crazy, right? Because those are opposites, you know? I mean, rebels and rule followers are usually on the opposite end of a scale. So to be able to combine those two, that makes you crazy. I, I see that all the time. I, I think it really is true that a lot of people in this business are insane. I'm kind of insane myself. Uh, I, I think it, I think it's almost required to have a kind of schizophrenia to be a successful creator, um, a commercially successful creator. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. And so many of my students are rebels. And so when they come into this process and I'm start showing, we start showing them tools, they're like, yeah, that's going to make my story a cliche. Um, and, and the fact is, the most rebellious, rule-breaking directors, uh, like, like Tarantino, um, they, they use these tools. The subjects they, write, they, they show are where they rebel. They show subjects that are crazy, that you wouldn't ever really be interested in, but the tools they use are classical, are, are powerful, are rigorous, and they employ them with the precision of an engineer. Let's take Hal Ashby, mm -hmm. wounded gentleman himself, mm -hmm. also a Hollywood rebel. How did he manage to hunker down somebody that had a foundation that I think was very rocky in the beginning, but he somehow, I think he, I'm not sure how he exactly started with editing, something like that. He, I think he had an amazing work ethic and it, it Having an amazing work ethic, uh, which is the same thing that gets you success as a used car salesman, is exactly a great, valuable tool to have as a creator. If you can pair rebellion with a, a great work ethic, I see success all the time uh, in, in the creative field. Um, it is the ability to tame your demons and to work anyway uh, that seems to be an extraordinarily important part of success. So um, again, I don't know if you've ever worked on a set, but it's some of the, it's 14, 16 hour days. There's, it's, it's kind of like working in a factory. It's, there's, there, there's very little sometimes glamorous about actually making a story. It is hard friggin' work. And it's discipline that propels the people I see actually in the field. They're the hardest working people I know. Uh, one of the writers I work with actually left Hollywood at 25. He'd had a career as a TV writer and he went back to a Midwestern city, penniless, and he worked in a used car lot for four years. And he told me that experience of becoming a good used car salesman brought him back to Hollywood and he employed all of those practices, you know, sales quotas, you know, get out there on the floor and sell. And he now writes big movies and he's incredibly successful. So and he's also a manic depressive, <laughs> but he's, he's, so he's got the discipline and he's also crazy. It, it's, that's a pretty good recipe for being a successful writer in Hollywood. <laughs> but I like what you just said a minute ago, you said something about discipline with your wounds anyway or something yeah, effective yeah. you keep it's just like a, that's a bumper sticker right there you, you, in spite of your trauma you, you keep at it you keep at it you work hard you have a structure you have a system uh, you're bleeding all over the place uh, maybe you wipe the cocaine off your nose uh, maybe you leave the abusive relationship that you've just you know, been beaten up over and then you go to the set and you work or you go to your uh, uh, computer and you work you, you show up and do the work regardless of what's going on in your personal life. And sometimes your personal life just takes a back seat. But no matter how chaotic it is, the discipline is always there in the, in the, in the, in the successful creators I see. The energy, they have the energy of, of 10 people. They have the discipline of a, a guy who's built their own company. 
Um, the idea that you're this lazy, wildly erratic drug addict who never gets off the couch and never does anything, that's, that's cool, but in my experience, those people don't sell their stories. You must develop discipline, in my experience, uh, and, and a great work ethic, or, or you won't succeed. It's, it's a myth uh, that the opium addict who simply sits on their couch and occasionally writes something and sends it off and gets it sold. I've, I've just never literally seen that happen. Not to say it doesn't, but I've never seen it.